episode of Genre Grinder. It's been a long year. It's been a long month. I know for me personally, between my own podcast, other people's podcasts, various Halloween-themed uh, articles and helpful hints, it was a long month. So uh, gonna. I also got another long thing coming up in December uh, with Patrick. So I thought that, you know, it'd be nice to take it down a notch, relax a little, talk about something fun, talk with someone who I happen to live with, don't have to worry with the Zoom calls or the Google calls, don't have to deal with editing together all this stuff after the fact. It's all in one place. So today... I'm with my girlfriend, Christine Fisher. Say hello, Christine. Hello, Christine. And, oh, the good, that's good. And we're going to be talking about slapstick, <laughs> silent era slapstick. Oh, excuse me. Oh, yeah, that was too loud for silent era. So um, this is something that Christine, Christine's a big fan of silent movies in general, but I think that the comedies tend to be the thing that she... It's kind of her quote fandom. Yeah, if it's if it could be a, a collegiate major, I would major in, in silent film. So I uh, always have known, well, not always, but I've long known the the silent horror movies. Uh, I and I knew some of these movies because they used to play them on uh, uh, Turner Classic Movies or AMC or Comedy Central on Sundays when I was younger. So I've always been aware of them, and I know I like them, but I don't think until the two of us started dating that I really started trying to collect them and think about them more critically. That's really how I started into it, too. It was basically AMC during the mornings. I don't know if it was Sunday for sure, but definitely AMC you know, cultivated a love for, for silent film in me. I, it, yeah, I think it was Sundays because I think that there were no cartoons on. Correct. And that's why I was watching It was either 700 Club or Silent Comedies. Yeah. (laughs) Your choice. Um, And then the stuff that I guess we'll go into at the very end just for a minute. But yeah, the other stuff that that those channels helped me Mm -hmm. get into was the just post-Silent Era stuff, like uh, Marx Brothers movies and Mm -hmm. then uh, Abbott and Costello movies, Mm -hmm. which, you know, have roots in silent stuff but they have roots in vaudeville for sure right so yeah why don't you explain to us as as my expert today uh and and, and what exactly slapstick means and what kind of movies are we going to be talking about well the origin of the term slaps slapstick is taken from uh history in uh french italian or european traveling theater or commedia dell'arte as the italians say um, and involving a traveling troupe of actors or comedians or people who just want to follow along a, like a, a troupe, like a circus. They go fr- from town to town doing, you know, either very organized or very unorganized skits. And to get a quick laugh from the yokels or the townspeople, they would stage mock foot chases throughout the, throughout the village. And um, they would make silly sounds and... People, or the actors eventually found out, people really like it when we hit someone behind, or the ass, or the rear. That item was known as a slapstick, or a batashio. And that's where the origin of the term slapstick comes from, because it it creates such a thwack, such a sound, that's like a slapstick. That's what its purpose is. And um, in the future, slapstick in, um, in the form of traveling theater would eventually migrate to a more like steady uh, traveling route of uh, like uh, vaudeville chains or circuits and music hall in Europe, especially. And so, and then vaudeville was something that really picked up in the in America in mm-hmm. the in the in the what late eighteen hundreds. Yes, and then definitely in the the early nineteen hundreds, and then people filtered from the vaudeville circuit into California or. Um, or film production companies or studios in New York or New Jersey, somewhere in the Midwest. Not that many were well known, but it's eventually started to crop up in California and, and matriculate through there. And that was it, and and in vaudeville wasn't just the comedy acts. There was also like stand up, right? Stand up, freak shows, uh, dance, dance, uh military related things um orators were a big one 
Oh. I think News of the World with Tom Hanks is going to come up pretty soon as, as far as a movie. Uh-huh. And he's basically a traveling orator who is out, outside of the circuit. He just travels on his own from town to town. Okay. Um, so it's it's sort of the first uh, kind of movies in a certain sense. I guess it... Right. it I mean, I, I guess uh, as far as me being a horror fan, I always think of uh, Grand Guignol as mm-hmm. like the basis for horror movies right um but even before that um there would be like stage shows that would mm-hmm. involve horror or um uh trying to fool uh, uh audience or theater goers into thinking something terrible was going on mm-hmm. um vaudeville did that but did that on the road they didn't stick to a, a solid stage for very long they they pulled up stakes and they went from town to town some towns that didn't even see a circus they went there mm-hmm. so uh, eventually, like people in the Midwest or people who are uh, moving out to live in the in the West or the the West Coast, they would they would eventually get around to seeing a show because it would come to them. And all they really needed was a stage. A stage or like um, uh, vaudeville museums were a thing too, mm. where um, unfortunately it's a lot like um, like. A, like a sex theater hmm. where uh, the door would come up if you put in a quarter or however much amount of money. They would do a little skit and then the door would come down again or the curtains would close. And they wouldn't perform again. They wouldn't perform their skit again until someone put in another quarter. So I think there were those were dime museums or Nickelodeons were, yeah. were films, but they were taken from the fact that you could insert a coin and get entertainment. Right, yeah, I was gonna say Nickelodeons, and then there's there was that was like the original porn was yeah. little Nickelodeon films, a lot of fun stuff. things. Oh yeah, uh, and because these movies are so old, a lot of them are just gone. Mm-hmm. They just don't exist. They weren't they the the celluloid itself couldn't survive, and Included. nobody was mm-hmm. going out of their way to preserve historians. No, it was considered. You know, pretty trashy entertainment, I I assume. Yeah, I mean, they didn't last very long. I mean, the, the clips we ourselves watched were no longer than 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, then you could compile a bunch and, and have a full day's uh, going out to theater if, if that's what you did during the teens and 20s before the advent of film and full-length features. So, yeah, that's they were built to be short, and probably due to their short length, the film quality was awful. Yeah, I played um, the game uh, Red Dead Redemption Two, mm-hmm. not too long ago, and there's a there's actually multiple options for a s- silent film theater, like mm-hmm. short cartoons, and then when you get to the bigger city, they actually have a vaudeville theater and yes. stuff. Yeah, I enjoyed those. Mightily. Yeah, that was really cute. <laughs> um, I apologize. I can hear the rain outside on the track when I'm recording it right now, and that's going to be too hard for me it's to cut out. Nice. I don't yeah. Know. <laughs> uh, so but uh, before we really get into it uh christine overheard me doing my director's club podcast uh last month and really liked the idea of what did we watch this week and thought since we've been kind of cooped up together throughout this whole covid thing that we would kind of quickly talk about some of the things we as a couple tried to either watch or make each other watch my big thing that I did, and I is I had a big pile of uh, movies that I had either bought myself mm-hmm. or gotten for gifts over the years, yes. and I finally I knocked. Pile. Yeah, it was it was huge, and mm-hmm. I finally knocked that down yeah. by making myself actually sit the and watch things. The of those films like looked me in the eye every time I walked by, like yeah. you're watching us right now. But the pandemic, you know, freed up a bunch of time, so. And there were some I could make you watch. Mm-hmm. Most recently for uh, Halloween, I decided I wanted to watch a bunch of uh, late 50s, early 60s uh, Japanese horror movies. Mm-hmm. And I have a couple of those. A and lot then we... of samurai issues. Yeah. A lot and... of folktales. That was awesome. Yeah, and I knew you would like the folktale type stuff. So, oh, yeah. yeah, we watched uh, some on the Criterion channel and some that I just happened to own. Basically, we, we ran out everything Criterion has in the in the realms of Japanese horror from that era. Yes, we wrung it dry. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and what else did I try to make you watch? Uh, early on, we had an agreement or a bond or a non-shaking of hands uh, promise to watch all the James Bonds. How far did we get? I Four or five. I think we made it into uh, only, only, I think we, we 
the man with the golden gun is the last one we mm-hmm. watched so we didn't make it very far into uh even uh uh roger moore's they they uh, yeah. personally i really don't like most of the roger moore movies i think that there's been a a, a sort of revival mm-hmm. look back like, i think they were considered kind of garbage mm-hmm. but now people sort of like them and appreciate yeah, and them cheesy. but they're just always really boring for me so i think the 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 point where we dropped off was Octopussy. We were just no, we didn't make it that far. We, we didn't. That was still like two down the line. Two more movies. In fact, that. I can't remember which one comes after Goldfinger, but I want to or Goldfinger, uh, Man with the Golden Gun. But I want to say it was actually one of the good ones, and we just haven't gotten to it mm-hmm. yet. <clears throat> but well, you liked uh, you liked uh, from Russia with Love and Gold. I certainly did. Yeah, you liked the good ones basically. <laughs> I like the idea of the military police being involved on an M5 mission. That was yeah. that was interesting to me. Yeah. And then what 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 other like Uh, we are going to watch some Ghibli movies. Yeah, uh, we never did get around to that. No, not really. Uh, the Criterion Olympics when you're talking about Criterion. That's right. Yeah, because there were no Olympics. sports. Correct. And Christine really likes sports and since we've been together, I pay more attention to sports I hadn't since I was like a teenager. Correct. And uh, Criterion has all these Bud... What are they? Bud... Uh, cra- Ooh, Greenspan. Bud Greenspan. And his brother. Him, and his brother does the... Uh, narration. The, the narration. They're, yeah. they're these documentaries. I think the first one is uh, 70... I want, oh, no. 72 or something. I can't remember where it starts, but one of the... It, they basically cover the Olympic years, um, the majority of the events, and they're like four-hour-long movies. Mm-hmm. It's very dramatic. Um, and, and that was a way to watch sports and a movie. Yes. And, and yeah, because they're so long, we would barely get through like half of one. Do you remember what we did uh, to eventually start watching those? No. When, uh, the, the point where we realized there was going to be no new sports at all. Yeah. We uh, had uh, rung out uh, ESPN The Ocho. Oh, yeah, we were watching we watched, The Ocho. We watched sign spinning. We watched... A watermelon or cherry pits uh, spitting. Yeah. We watched uh, a greased slide climbing thing. Yeah. Yeah, that was crazy. That was yeah. the the absolute worst. A lot of those ever. sound like more fun than they end up being. Yeah. 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 It all depends on the presentation, the announcements. A lot of those happened at state fairs for some mm-hmm. reason, or um, off uh, the um, uh, off strip from uh, Las Vegas, mm-hmm. like convention center type things. That's where there was like ping pong or like air guitar and juggling, full contact juggling. Full contact juggling yes. where you have to try to knock. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah, and it just didn't have the same thrill. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, most of the Olympic ones were from years. We were both born in 1980. Mm-hmm. Um, years that we were at least somewhat aware of the world of, around <laughs> us sports yeah so i remembered certain things from them yeah that was fun oh uh, we caught up on some anime um then we resorted to the 1001 movies to see before you die oh yeah we didn't get very far we watched a few things yeah again the criterion channel helped there but i i mm-hmm. owned quite a few of them and there was a for a while, the Turner Classic Movies, but they actually put stuff on HBO Max now, so there's some good stuff there. I, I really liked watching the Bubs, Bubsy Berkeley yes, stuff, which is, you know, that's just out of the silent era. Correct. Netflix happened to drop a lot of original and new series that I really picked up and liked. The big, blazing, all-time favorite one for me now is Yuri's Ben Breakfast or Yuri's Home State from South Korea. Right. She, yeah, it's this, this reality show where these two famous, this couple that's famous musicians in Korea run a bed and breakfast mm-hmm. with another famous musician as a, uh, or p- performing artist. As like as a, a house servant. Or, yeah, um, as help. Yeah. And uh, it's cute. I was cute. so surprised to see him. Yeah, usually I didn't watch all of that, that. <laughs> but yeah, you watched most of that. It was so cozy and nice. Uh, then the British Bake Off came on. Then we started to. Um, that's right. Uh, um, Umbrella Academy came back. Mm. Lovecraft C- Country premiered. Mm-hmm. Fargo came back. Um, I started really getting into Formula One. Uh, every other Sunday or so, it would yeah. come up with a new race. Uh, Stanley Cup. The and Stanley then, Cup was fun. Yeah, it was. Though every time I was rooting for a team, safe. they lost. Yeah. For the most part. <laughs> yeah, that's unfortunate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, 
I got a new closeness to Gritty during the games and during the elections. Yeah, yeah, that was true. Gritty became like the mascot for the end of the elections there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then eventually I started watching football again. I think the only movies we actually spent money on because was uh, Bill and Ted Face the Music and The Invisible Man. That's right. Uh, I think all the rest ended up on some service we already had. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, but I like, yeah, they were good. Oh, we drew from the material that we had as far as Blu-rays. And yeah, I have like a thousand Blu-rays. And yeah, may as well get to watching those. Some of them I know she'll hate, but... <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's what we watched this year instead of this week. So yeah, just know. in case they have a, uh, a copyright on what did we watch this week. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so getting into it, mm-hmm. uh, we kind of tried to start with the Keystone stuff. We did. Right. Which is um, Keystone Cops is the one I think most people know because it became kind of a uh, idiom. an idiom in itself mm-hmm. that when people are bad at something they're the Keystone Cops. They're bumbling, they uh, have a hard time uh, gaining speed, cohesion as a group, and it just comes off really unprofessional. Yeah, like if you're at a restaurant and everybody keeps dropping the food, or like the wait staff keeps tripping over each other, you'd say it's the Keystone Cops of wait staff. Yes. It's like a, it's one of those idioms that, that you don't even know where it comes from. You mm-hmm. just, yeah. And it, and it did survive into the sound era because there were uh, Evan and Costello. Correct. They picked it up yeah. as being someone they meet. Right. Um, the Keystone Cops was developed by Keystone Pictures, which was originated by Max Sennett. Max Sennett uh, started out uh, Triangle Films, which is uh, the production company of a few of the movies we're watching. And... Um, uh, Max Sennett eventually devolved into Max Sennett Corporation, and then his career failed. Um, that turned out to be the the common habit for actors or producers to create their own production company mm-hmm. and have their movies distributed by a big studio. And that was like that Chaplin was the one who was very successful at that, correct? Yes, because not only that, he had his own studio with United Artists, right. with um, uh, Mary Pickford and. Uh, uh, Douglas Fairbanks. So we ended up a lot uh, uh, fewer. Uh, I guess a lot of these movies just don't exist anymore. But mm-hmm. there's some Keystone Cops on YouTube. We watched one that was apparently supposed to be one of the original ones, which mm-hmm. was the Bangville Police. It introduced the Keystone Cops, which from 1913. So this is more than a hundred years old at this point. There only really seem to be two cops, whereas there's supposed to be like seven yeah, of them. I I think. Yeah, this was like an early, You can early fit one. two people in a car. You can't fit seven to nine people in a car. I, yeah, I think that's the image most people have of the Keystone Cops is them, uh, too many of them on a car moving at fast speed. Hanging on during and, a really like long curve. And they'll take a curve and some of them will fall off. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, and uh, Bangville Police, which I like, it was a rare movie that could be its own parody, porn parody without changing the title. Yeah. Um, directed by Harry Learman. Uh, do we know anything about Harry Lerman? Sure no. No, he was just probably in the system. Yes. The Keystone system. And the Keystone system produced basically everybody we're about we're gonna talk about throughout this. Just about except for Harold Lloyd. Yeah, except for one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh and I so the idea I got from these really, really early uh slapstick things is obviously the vaudevilleness of him. Yes. And and the idea that they were trying to uh put it outside. Because yes. they didn't need a stage. Correct. But at this early f- stage, I don't think that they quite had a handle on, like, it feels like the idea here was to try to combine serial action with vaudeville comedy. Correct. Um, which is like, I don't know, like the thesis statement of slapstick, sort of, yeah, as, a, as a film genre, I should say. Right. Um, definitely starting out, it was hard to find material that universally everyone would find funny. Right. I mean, slapstick, the origins of just hitting someone on the butt um, very loudly with a stick, doesn't translate to sound film very well. You right. can't hear the thwap of it. Yeah, you could have some guy there with a thwap and it, it, it <laughs> <laughs> timing himself a to it. A impressive instrument. One a lot, and wordplay was really important, too. Mm-hmm. And that comes out in the Marx Brothers movies, which were just out of the header. double entendres yeah. puns yes for sure and talking really fast that was their thing and there's still like really strict formulas like the marx brothers movies have very strict formulas to the point where you realize oh now they're gonna have a piano moment and mm-hmm. now they're gonna so that that whole thing the marx brothers i i 
not knowing too much to me represents vaudeville perfectly yes it's, uh, it was really the start of uh stage parents too because uh-huh. their mother many made their careers uh-huh. and the reason they um went so divergently on different paths like marco what uh, marco 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 <laughs> marx marco. marco polo marx polo marx yeah I sleep for a crowd so i don't know how mm. it came out marco maybe chico and uh, groucho had some sort of ancestral baby and called it marco anyway Groucho was known for being the leader, very satirical, very witty, really big on the double entendres, twirling his mustache, that whole thing. And he always poked fun at his or brothers. Or the eyebrows, his thing, that, yeah, the raising. Yeah. yeah. And um, Chico was known for playing the piano, being Italian when they were really Russian Jew, mm. or German Jew. And uh, Harpo, silent, mute, honking horn near his belt for some reason, played the harp very well. Zeppel, my favorite. Oh, he, he was known for being handsome. Yes, <laughs> Vanessa knows, beautiful man. And he tried to um, make excuses for the kind of like zany comedy that his brothers were doing. He was the straight man. Of sorts, yeah. In, all, in some of the movies. Yeah, he had a sense of humor for, for what they were doing, but he tried to explain away or make, normalize what his brothers were doing. So if you're thinking of it from that standpoint, people who haven't seen these movies... Uh, Harpo is the slapstick part Absolutely. of vaudeville but brought to life. But he needs Chico to, uh, to chase him. Right. You need, yeah, you need someone else doing it. Mm-hmm. So these movies are like, these really early ones are sort of, let's take this and put it outside because we can mm-hmm. film now. Yes. And so this one, uh, uh, Bangville Police was all on a farm. Yes. And they basically have one joke. Mm-hmm. And that's that they think the cow's been stolen, and mm-hmm. it turns out they just misplaced it. And it turns out to be a very, very common theme, theme for all of the movies we're watching. Uh-huh. Misunderstandings. Misunderstandings must have been very funny. In the, yes. Yeah. Which and is something you... They didn't know that they really meant this. Oh, isn't that universally? Don't you do that every day? Yeah. Which to me is a very British comedy thing. Musical. And, and a very Japanese one. A lot of oh, yeah. Japanese comedies that I've seen. Breaking social rules. Yeah, you and... messed up a social rule. Yes. Yeah. Um But yeah, I I personally don't think that the Keystone that these cop these movies just aren't they don't transcend their time. I didn't mm-hmm. laugh very much. No, I mean, there's, like, historical jokes lodged in there that makes perfect sense to the, to the audiences they were meant for. Mm-hmm. But to us, it's like, oh, that's not really that funny. And and so then we uh, we watched uh, this sort of uh, bridge here to uh, Roscoe Arbuckle, mm-hmm. uh, who most people know as Fatty Arbuckle. That was his stage name. I find it offensive. Which you find offensive yes. if you want to. And so so in our household, I always say Roscoe Arbuckle. Mm-hmm. I, I don't use the fatty word. but And then we tried to tell Patrick and, and Regina about it, but then... Yeah, they didn't... Uh, they, had, they had no idea who Roscoe Arbuckle Until was. Until we said fatty. Yeah, and so uh, Roscoe Arbuckle and Mabel... Norman. Norman were kind of a, a duo. They were paired, yeah. And that's the whole... That's the joke, say goodnight. Gracie. Gracie. Mm-hmm. Good night, Gracie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but obviously they didn't have sound in no, these movies. Like, so we watched Fatty Joins the Force, which was directed by George Nichols uh, and stars Roscoe Arbuckle. And, um, Mabel was not in this one. No. Uh, and it's sort of like, it's not really a Keystone short, but it's sort of like the idea that he uh, he, he saves, the, uh, saves a little girl from drowning, not by his own accord he's shoved into the water to save her yes and is labeled a hero and just put on the police force without any experience his father is like the the chief of the chief of police yeah i think that's what they said yes and so yeah that that i mean that's a kind of funny joke (laughs) i don't think i laughed at any of the jokes with well i did laugh because they they he takes off his uniform to clean himself correct and they find his uniform and just assume he died Mm -hmm. and so they're holding a vigil for him Yes. That's a pretty funny joke, I suppose. <laughs> but um, but you start to see some of the sort of, I think something that defines these this era of slapstick is the um, the uh, acrobatic abilities of the performers and the um, the need to find a gimmick for what your own comedic style was. Roscoe was a fat man, therefore he was fatty. Charlie Chaplin started out in musical theater, um, originally to, uh, with the intent to be dramatic went into comedy. He went to uh, Keystone Films or Triangle. He borrowed Roscoe Arbuckle's outfits, large shoes, large hats, and a stick, and became the tramp. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and then Arbuckle was a uh, mentor to Buster Keaton, correct? Yes, they met each other. Um, they're close friends in real life. Um, people found it humorous and kind of unnerving that um, uh, Buster Keaton turned out to be the stone face. Never cracked a smile, never cracked a joke, but he was capable of such physical comedy that it, um, and it was cultivated through vaudeville that he did acrobatics and pratfalls. That was just his thing. He never got hurt. Mm-hmm. And so, so yeah, Roscoe Arbuckle is an important figure here, even if he's not. Unfortunately, and, and we won't go into the details, but unfortunately, Roscoe Arbuckle's career collapsed because he was uh, falsely accused of a very brutal murder. And it coincided with the rise of modern censorship. Yeah, and so... It wasn't even a murder. It was a, uh, a, a urinary tract infection that went wrong or Wrongful something like death. that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but it, even though he was found innocent uh, and the judge even wrote a special letter saying, like, mm-hmm. these super innocent guys, yeah. the the sort of general idea was that he wasn't, uh, that he was... Squeaky clean image. Yeah. And that, so he was destroyed. And it's unfortunate because he's one of... He was, you know, at the head of all this, mm-hmm. and he probably could have done really well in sound film. Yeah, the 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 downside to, to working in sound is that you had to use the voice that you you were born with. Uh, both Roscoe and Buster, unfortunately, had very gravelly voices. Mm-hmm. So, and then he, with sound film, you just had to mouth me. He was... probably he probably would have, like, been in a. Uh, he could have had like, oh God, what's his name? Uh, the guy who plays gangsters and. Uh, Oh, Edward G. Robinson? Yeah, oh, not even James him. Cagney? Not even him. Who am I thinking of? The big guy. <laughs> the big white guy. hair is always squinting. I guess he Raft? didn't play gangsters, huh? George Raft? Raft, yeah. Okay. Ar- Arbuckle, like, Raft kind of took what could have been Arbuckle's later career, I think. I disagree with that. You disagree? Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, and then so we watched Fatty and Mabel Adrift from 1916, which was directed by Arbuckle. Yes. Rusko. Mm-hmm. And so this was sort of... Well, from what I understand, is a, a sort of quint, uh, a quintessential Roscoe and Mabel or yes. Fatty and Mabel uh, they, short. They go do something. And it was yeah, it's longer than the other ones. Yes. Um, the the idea behind this one is that, and this one's also on YouTube if you want to see it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's still kind of primitive compared to what we what came out only ten years later. Yes. But you can see the the sort of things happening where they're starting to mess with editing and cinematography more. Um, it, it's just that that film changed so quickly in this era. Mm-hmm. So many things about what movie making was, because it was such a new art form. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but we are living in the that modern quote modern times, where uh, you didn't have to be stuck with certain forms. Yeah, I mean, you could make a, a house float for. For example, right. you can stretch reality and, and just extend it beyond what um, people watching films are used to. And so you're adding, by special effects, you're adding magic tricks mm-hmm. to the Absurdity, thing. Absurdity, things that shouldn't be the case, and then therefore humor. Right. And so you can film something that you can't perform on stage. Yes. Uh, and I think this one, actually, Fatty Mabel Adrift uh, has some cinematic qualities to it, too. There's a scene where... He's their their house is too close to the ocean is basically the the gist here. Oh, I I, I interpret it as them being on a honeymoon. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Yes, they're on their like honeymoon. A cottage. So like yeah, the cottage that they're staying at, and he's fishing, and and there's a joke where he pulls in a fish that's too big, and they kind of wrestle, but they shoot it mostly in silhouette. Yeah. Which, that's that's a cinematic trait there. And they're shooting night for night because it's mm-hmm. so dim. And then, and then, so there's some, you know, just a couple years. This has only been three years since the other movies. Mm-hmm. They're already taking stuff from, like, the uh, German expressionists that are being, like, like all those horror movies that were really over the top. And pretty soon they're going to start taking editing lessons from the Russians mm-hmm. and their montage thing. It's not as straightforward already. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, this one, they end up literally adrift inside a house. Yes. And it's a pretty spectacular set it is it looks dangerous i felt scared for the dog there's a dog that probably doesn't know what the hell is happening (laughs) yes um he thinks his owner uh roscoe is in real danger yeah yeah you said that they tended to use to use um uh, pets or animals that were uh trained and owned by either a actor or a crew member Mm mm-hmm 
Um, and I think another thing you can see at this point that that is a big thing for me personally is uh, the roots of cartoon comedy. Yes. Because I think for the most part, we still have slapstick movies, but I think cartoons really took over slapstick for a lot yeah. for the most part. They, they really picked up what was humorous. Like, oh, you guys like this thing, this movie? Let's put it in a, in a cartoon. So you can see like... Those early Disney and Max Fleischer cartoons, mm -hmm. the way things move, and the the sort of uh, the 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 movement of characters is then exaggerated, but they were already exaggerated mm -hmm. at this point. And the expressions of the and their characters. expressions because they're wearing makeup. Yes. To make like, and that's a big deal in the horror movies is they have white faces with outlined eyes so that they really express but it works in the comedy too yes i think it was something growing up that the comedies were always a little bit eerie to me because mm -hmm. of that makeup because that became a bigger thing for horror movies yes yeah um so I, yeah so we're yeah it's the, now we're getting into the big year that we, i don't think we did this on purpose we just sort of picked some movies and it turned out most of them came out in 1925 <laughs> Uh, kind of, what is the year, 1984 of, of horror films and, and slasher films? Yeah, and like 99, or no, 81 was the big one for slasher films. And like 99 was a big deal for like uh, American, uh, Hollywood studios trying experimental stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's there's years that this kind of stuff happens. Yes. 2020 will be the year when no movies came out. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, but, but we'll maybe get a really interesting Oscars this year because they'll have to pick from the stuff that was much smaller in scale. They can't pick the, the big. Turned out. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, 1925. And I wanted to start with, oh, I actually gave Christine the option to not do a Charlie Chaplin movie Yeah. because she, uh, she cares about the sort of personal stories and the tabloid qualities of yeah. these people as performers. For sure. So Chaplin was known for being a prick. Yes. And whereas Ross, yeah, love him and leave him type of thing. And Roscoe Arbuckle was known for being likable. Yes. So, uh, I think that yeah, that feeds a lot of what you think about Chaplin. Yeah, I had to address my my bias mm -hmm. and um, begrudgingly choose to watch The Gold Rush. Yeah, she picked The Gold Rush. I just say for the record, my favorite Chaplin movie is Modern Times. Mm -hmm. The two of us watched that already. It was for one of your college classes, right? I think so. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I think Modern Times is my favorite, but uh, she picked Gold Rush, and uh, looking into it, it seems like that was his favorite too. Yes. And again, this is the twenty five nineteen twenty five version. Apparently, he George Lucas up. Yeah, the director's movie in, cut in forty two. Redid some add, of the storylines, cut some scenes, added sound. Yeah. Uh, and I guess this version was sort of lost for a while. Yes. It's on Criterion Channel and HBO Max uh, as of this recording. It feels like everything just drops off of HBO Max with no warning, though, so I don't know how long that will be on there. DC, Criterion. Yeah, it's just time. random. Um, so, but this is a good Chaplin movie. It sort of encapsulates the things that I like and don't like about him. Mm -hmm. I think mo Modern Times is probably a little more uh, experimental political. and political. Yeah, and so, yeah, this is a better... Because this is this is a Little Tramp movie. Yes. For sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess you want to describe the storyline? Basically, it's the Little Tramp or um, uh, Chaplin entering a... Um, remember how we, we thought it was going to be California? Yeah, because when you think Gold Rush, you think California Gold Rush. But um, It's the Klondike Gold Rush. Klondike, and, correct. Which was pretty... So it's a period piece, but mm -hmm. only by like thirty years. Yeah, it, and then somehow the, the the little tramp ends up there. He's having a perfectly fine time going through um, tundras around cliffs, being followed by a sun bear, and he runs into a lot of people who, in my mind, resembled uh, Jack London or Ernest Hemingway. They're just mm -hmm. these rugged fur coat wearing men who are subsisting off of little to no food in their search for gold. Then um, one of these Jack London types find that um, his claim is a gold mountain. And um, uh, the three people who, who meet, uh, including Little Tramp, they part ways. And Little Tramp goes into town um, where he's basically invisible. 
he um, he has people l literally look past and through him, in in, in order to see uh, these these rugged manly men, and they they pick on they pick on him. For and that. he's this little shabby guy with mm -hmm. clothes that you would die wearing in the Klontek. <laughs> that that's Jeez. that's part where you have to kind of uh, suspend your disbelief. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. And he um, eventually, uh, through a lot of hard work and. Um, her basically ignoring this kind of um, Bluto looking guy in order to um, they, they start dancing together and um, he is really you know um, he's smitten he's smitten a whole lot by her and she's a, a dancing girl with this one um, bar or saloon and uh, eventually her and her uh, fellow dancing girlfriends uh, go to his cabin that he's basically cab cabin sitting for another guy who's a prospector mm -hmm. and um, they make a make a farce of him and make fun of him and um, they make a date to yeah they play uh, a really cruel joke absolutely. which is making a date that, yeah that they don't plan on, on New Year's yeah who stands up up someone on New Year's Eve um, he makes this really nice dinner, makes a gift uh, for her, and all the while they're at the saloon, and she's swearing her love to the Bluto bad guy, and they eventually, after the stroke of midnight, remember they had this date with this guy. And he leaves the house thinking they're not going to go, and she goes into the house realizing all the hard work he's Yeah, doing. they were actually going to make fun of him even more, yes. and then she sees all his hard work. Yeah, he had really made a sincere effort, and she's sad about it. And then um, one of the people who found the gold mound comes back and uh, says, I, I made a claim, but I don't remember where it is. It's by the cabin. Who else knows where the cabin is? Oh, my gosh. So this trip. Yeah, they find, his name is Big Jim. He actually, yeah. That's right. Big I like Jim. Big Jim. Yep. He finds a tramp, and he says, we need to equipped up and um, go, go back to this, this cabin, and that's where my claim is. They eventually find the house, they go to sleep, and then they find themselves on the edge of a cliff during a storm. Right, which is, yeah. So, I would say, they, well, then they, they eventually get the claim. Yeah. And become millionaires, and then the girl loves him, I, I guess. Of sorts. Um, which is sort of, there's a little bit of, every, yeah, like I said, things I don't like about Chaplin's movies and things I do like. Mm. And I think it's almost unfair to compare this to the other two movies from this year we're going to talk about, because a lot of Chaplin's movies were a big genre movie that the tramp wanders into. Yes. So this is this. Yeah. Jack London. I didn't even think of Jack London, but you're right. <laughs> it's a Jack London story. Yes. It's it's White Fang or Call of the Wild minus the dogs plus the littlest tramp. The dogs make a minor. Thing. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's really like. He want he's making big dramas, mm -hmm. and then sort of inserting this one character. It's kind of like a foil. Yeah, whereas um, the one we're going to talk about after this one, uh, "Go West" mm -hmm. by Buster Keaton, that is a Buster Keaton western. Yes, that's not a western that Buster Keaton wanders into. Yeah. I think it's a different thing. I think they have something in common in that they they do kind of wander into something, but they want to become part of something. Right. They want to work their way up. Yeah, so so yeah, Buster Keaton's version of of a western is isn't it funny that Buster Keaton's in a western? Mm -hmm. And Charlie Chaplin's version of a of a western is uh look at this western and how great it is. Mm -hmm. And oh yeah, there's also this this uh, Minor guy. Romance. Yeah. And and then like breaks for really big set pieces. Mm -hmm. So like the things that in this movie, and the, unfortunately, the thing that makes the Gold Rush not as funny as some of these other, other movies, is that um, its best gags uh, have been stolen. Yes. I I don't know if this is the original 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 time this happens, but there's the part where Big Jim and the Tramp are stuck in a, in this uh, cabin together, and they're starving, and Big Jim starts to see uh, the Tramp as a chicken. Yes. I don't know if that's the first time they've done this thing, but that's a thing that's in every cartoon. Any cartoon where someone's hungry, they start to see the person as food. As the T-bone steak is a big one. Right. And so, or a big ham, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and so 
that joke is done to death, so it's not that funny anymore. <laughs> Another um, who did first occasion that comes in this movie is the roll dance. Yeah. Which is something that the tramp does to entertain the dancing girls. He puts two. But boys. only in his mind. That's it's right. his version it's of what would go right mind. if he would entertain, but then he falls asleep That's and it right. doesn't actually. Yeah, so, but go on the roll dancing. Uh, he puts two forks and dinner rolls and acts like they're feet of someone doing like a, like a little soft shoe. Uh huh. And there is some debate on if Russ Gorbachev did it first, Buster Keaton did it first, uh, and then Tra- Charlie Chaplin did it, and um, one of the um, uh, members of the Three Stooges alleged they did it first before mm-hmm. any of them so and know, then Johnny Depp did it in Benny and June mm-hmm. which meant that then the Simpsons did it because it was in the Benny and June and it was on people's minds and sort of brought it back Benny and June also kind of indicates that uh, Buster Keaton did it first because he wears a pork pie hat the whole movie yeah he's sort of a weird amalgamation mm-hmm. But I, I really think when that movie came out in the early 90s, mm-hmm. I feel like like people are only talking about Chaplin movies. I mean, I was young, so I don't know the for Chaplin sure. The Chaplin movie would be made a few years after that. Yeah, and I think that, that there was a lot of... I think that critics always talk about Chaplin because he generally makes dramas that have really big scope to them. Mm-hmm. Whereas Keaton and, and Harold Lloyd tend to make comedies. And um, there's also a, another thing, too, is that um, Buster Keaton, um, though he was often forgotten in, in reference to, uh, with regards to uh, Charlie Chaplin, but Charlie Chaplin was, he got in a boat off of New York Harbor and asked not to come back. Yeah. I mean, there's a point where he was anti-American. Yeah. And he um, was best in, uh, you know, left to England, so. Yeah. And then, and he, had the, and he also remained in the critical eye because he made uh, uh, the, the Dictator, the Great Dictator, Correct. which was controversial at the time and is now considered a very... But, so, yeah, he made, a, he made a pretty easy journey, inroad into sound at the time. There was mm-hmm. still early sound. Um, the thing I don't like about a lot of Chaplin's Tramp movies is I find them very maudlin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, City Lights and The Kid, if I'm remembering them correctly. It's been a long time since I've seen those two. Mm-hmm. I, I just remember them, like, really hamming up the, the sadness. Yes. And I think the gold rush, the drama, a lot of the drama really comes from the fact that the, it sucked to be in the Klondike gold rush. It did, and it sucked <laughs> to be ignored. It sucks to be bullied. Uh, these other two movies have a lot of aspects of bullying. Like yeah, yeah. These, these men have it too easy. We should bully them. Yeah, and there's, there, yeah, there's definitely a lot of bullying. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if that's because... I, it just seems like that was because that was what Keaton and, and Chaplin both did. Yes. Was characters who got bullied Mm -hmm. but i think that they also chaplin in particular played the little tramp can be kind of a dick he's not he's he's lovelorn and so shoveling scene yeah and there's there's scenes in his other movies where he just sort of does rude things and he'll kick a dog you know uh and so yeah there's there's scenes in the gold rush where you're like yeah he's not a perfect person here which is kind of i think fitting with who he was um, the other thing I think that uh, Chaplin does well, even though I find his romance kind of dumb because he doesn't, I don't know, he's Just sort of idealizing one. himself yes. a little too much. Yes. Um, I think that he his movies tend to have uh, better female leads with just more to do. Mm, I think this one in particular, I think uh, Georgie Hale um, has a lot of personality and she has a real arc. Mm-hmm. And I think in a lot of the other movies, the only arc is uh, they decide. I have to love him. Yeah. Whereas in this case, if she really goes back and forth and she mm-hmm. continues to try to be with this asshole guy. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it, it's so, I, I, I mean, I think that Chaplin had an understanding of women, even if he was a philanderer and a piece of shit to them, that he respected what they could bring to a movie in a way. Because it was, it was, it was very often... Um, the case where women in comedy were, um, they start out, um, women in general start out as being models, then actresses, serious actresses, and comedics, if they could handle it. They had to pull a lot of expressions, they had to 
uh, reserve any kind of agency that they could have for that role and just just do the do non physical humor. And and that and then the kind of thing that still existed by the time we're to uh, I Love Lucy the that sort of crying thing that I love that Lucy does that wah, that's very vaudeville even though we're like a solid 30 years removed from it at that point. Um, the one I always think is really funny is, um, I can't remember who it was. Who's in, uh, uh, the airplane movie. <laughs> the airplane movie? Was it Nielsen? No, 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 no. Uh, the silent <laughs> film, the first Oscar oh, winner. Clara Bow. The yeah. Wings. Clara Bow. I think Wings, Clara Bow yeah. is really funny in that Absolutely. movie. Um, so it's Speaking really, of another person that didn't make it a talkie. She had a very thick Brooklyn accent. Yeah. So I think that the women and Mabel, uh, what's her name? Norman. Norman. A lot of their comic appeal is they were still, they all, like, 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 it's definitely a problem. It's hard to tell these women apart because they <laughs> are all flappers. They all have the same build and can, makeup and your, hair. Your hair, long hair up to look yeah. like a bob. But I, I think that the women who could be cute flappers but still have, I think, more than that just pulling faces. I think, like, Clara Bow is actually really funny and... Mm -hmm. Because she she does funny things. She's more physical. She laughs at herself, too. Yeah. She makes goals for herself in the similar way that Chaplin and Keaton do. Yeah. And I think Chaplin, in this movie, at least, I guess Modern Times doesn't have much going on for female performance. But um, really? it's kind of mean. It's a man's world. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I think Georgie Hale is actually, and she's an actress I don't think I've ever seen anything else in. Mm -hmm. Uh, she, do that much else. she replaced uh, Chaplin's then wife Lita Gray like late just before filming started. It yes. said, and then I found out she almost replaced uh, Virginia Virginia Sherrill in City Lights a couple years later. Um, so it seems like she was sort of Chaplin's kind of. She was like in his back pocket. Yes. Just okay. ready for whenever he needed a good leading woman. And I think it's 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 saying a lot that she never romantically got involved with him, never became his wife, never got mm -hmm. clo much closer. They were they were close for the rest of, uh, her, she died, you know, maybe ten or twenty years afterward. But they were close. Um, they maintained a professional relationship, and they were friends. Yeah, it said that she actually made money in real estate, is what I read. Nice. So yeah, she just kind of got out of films. Um, yeah, so the big, yeah, so there's the eating scene, and the other scene we have to talk about is the scene where they're on the edge of the cliff. Yes. And it's uh, really, you know, it's 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 primitive special effect by modern standards, but it, it was probably very expensive at the it's time. Very small marionette thing. Like, oh, yeah, they, and, yeah, they yeah, they have a model. About that. They have a model that tilts on the uh, on the model of the the cliff. Cliff, and then they have a set. That appears to actually move mm -hmm. because I, they are faking moving at first. They're doing the whole Star Trek, you shake the camera thing. Yes. But I, I, th those, uh, I can't remember the actor playing Big Jim, but Chaplin and him can't do some of that stuff. Some of it, yeah. Um, the other part uh, that came up, <laughs> but um, really uh, that got my attention was when um, the wind was blowing earlier on in the film, that was blowing through the the cabin through in one door and then out the other door. Mm -hmm. The fact that uh, Chaplin can basically moonwalk forward, mm -hmm. subsiding on nothing at all, that is a huge vaudeville talent. Yeah, yeah. And that and that's that's just Chaplin's physical skills. And, and fortunately, I don't think the, the Big Jim character could do that either, so he did what he could. I yeah. His, then, his thing was being big. He was hired for his size. And then you immediately said during, while it was happening... Big Jim shouldn't climb up on top of Charlie Chaplin. It should be the other way. Around. He's, he's heavier than him. Yeah. So, but I think they must have had the the actual set on a gimbal too. Perhaps yes. It just seems like there was too extreme of an angle, but may, maybe not. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're just that good physically. Uh, they definitely didn't have the um, dancing on the ceiling thing yet. Nope. No winner. <laughs> but they, you know, like this is this because these were popular movies. And it said it, uh, it was the fifth highest grossing film of the silent era. Fortunately, I did not research which the uh, top four were. <laughs> I'm sure they were great. They were probably also a couple Chaplin movies in there. Um, but so, yeah, this was like, this was a blockbuster movie. This was a big deal movie. Yes. Um, 
Yeah. That didn't shoot in Alaska. No. Or um, they built sets. They built yes. full on sets. He had tried to uh, work out of Truckee, uh, which is a, a mountainous town in California, where there was snow, but that turned out not to work out so well. Yeah, it's very hard to work in real snow. Mm -hmm. uh, you can kind of tell it's fake snow, but the fact that it's black and white, or so a lot, some of these movies, when we say black and white, the cell and error really like tinting things. Yes. As something that uh, I think was lost for a while. They would find these old movies and they wouldn't take the tinting uh, uh, notes. So, like, the old VHS and TV versions were just black and white. Mm -hmm. And the years since, they've started to correctly tint them according to what they were supposed to. The big tinting one that comes to my mind especially is Peter Pan. Peter Pan, yeah. Um, and, and uh, God, what was the one we saw? Uh, the Lodger? Yes. The lodger has certain scenes it tinted has certain yellowing, ways. Some yellowing, some some blue darkness. Mm -hmm. Yes, beautiful film. So yeah, uh, and then wow, we're moving right along. Uh, <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I mean, these are short movies. I guess is what it comes down to. Yes. And again, we're well, this is the mellow podcast. Sorry. No, no, no. I'm just telling the. I'm just reminding the audience that they can take it cool. Um, so then we watched Go West. Which was my well, the one thing I demanded we watch mm -hmm. because I think it, if you can say such a thing, I think it's the most underrated of Buster Keaton's feature length movies. The, the general gets a lot of attention. Steamboat Willie gets, no, wait, Steamboat Bill Jr. gets Steamboat a lot of attention. Bill Jr. <laughs> um, yeah, seven those are days, probably, seven chances, or no, one week, seven chances. I think that I would say the general and Steamboat Bill Jr. are the two because that the general is the one with the train. Mm -hmm which has amazing train stunts that apparently cost a bazillion dollars. Mm -hmm. And uh, Steamboat Bill Jr. is the one with the frame of the house falls around I think him. it might be Steamboat Bill and Sherlock Jr. Sorry. Sherlock Jr. is another one that was pretty bad. Uh, though, uh, yeah, but it, when people picture Buster Keaton, they usually picture the whole frame of the house falling around him. Yes. Uh, or him being on the front of a, a train. Yes. So Go West uh, is a little bit before those. Um, and I think it, it's actually when you get it on DVD or Blu-ray, it's almost always coupled with the Battling Butler, which is another I think kind of overlooked yeah. Buster Keaton movie. Yes, um, but the idea of Gold West, so like I said, Gold Rush is a a sort of western that that um, Chaplin wanders into. Go West is 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 a western built around Keaton's sort of stone face character. Yes. Does he? I mean, does he ever have a name? He just is. And this, and this he's called he's friendless. 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 He has a name like that in every one of them, like a like a descriptive name. Something close to it, yeah. Um. And uh, I, the uh, yeah, the idea here is uh, uh Buster, well, well, the first idea is Buster Keaton as a hapless cowboy, mm -hmm. which is already enough to build a movie around. Yes. Uh, but like like that's what the general is. The general is sort of uh, Buster Keaton in a war movie with incredibly perilous stunts yes uh uh which and he it brings his wife through too yeah which i i think of as a sort of spoof of serials again like yes. i think it's like the perils of pauline yeah and then um this is a spoof like westerns were another genre that did really well in the silent era mm -hmm. because you could shoot them outside this just went this one just had an irregular love interest and that's okay. Right. And so, well, but that's the thing. Yeah. It's so, like, that could be a movie right there. It's just Buster Keaton as a hapless cowboy. Yeah. But what the heart of the movie is really Buster Keaton uh, falls in love with a cow. Yes. That's really the hard movie and not in a dirty way. Yeah. But like, they respect he, each other. Yeah. And so, like, he, keep each other alive. he has no idea what's going on in the West. Mm -hmm. But he, he, he puts it together. He's a dynamic, adaptive character. Right. He's like, I need a gun. I need taps, I need to walk a certain way, I need to ride a horse, but don't hurt my cow. Right, and so he's afraid of everything in the desert when he first gets there. Yes. Which being, growing up in the desert, this is supposed to take place around Santa Fe, mm -hmm. not too far from Tucson. <clears throat> Same basic environment. Actually, Santa Fe's a little nicer, mm -hmm. it's colder. There's lots of ranches there? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a cooler climate, though. But, um, you know cactuses rattlesnakes and he's afraid of everything but then this uh cow he helps a cow get a rock out from her to her hoof mm -hmm. and then she rescues him from a, a, a charging bull mm -hmm. and so this character sort of like this is this is the most important thing in his life now is this mm -hmm. cow 
And so a lot of the movie is like half the movie is him doing tasks either in an unusual way or totally failing. Or um, he's annoyingly doing very well at them. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, he is tricked into he he they say put the steers back in. And there's the uh, the the myth that that bulls uh, charge red. red. Mm -hmm. So he uh, leads the bulls in with red, but he doesn't really. And I I think the ultimate joke here is that because this one cow is so nice to him, Mm -hmm. most of the movie he doesn't understand how dangerous cows can be. Yes. So they're not going to hurt him. Right. And so it's like the same thing that happens in. uh, I don't remember which movie it is where he's going between the buildings. Between the buildings. With big uh, wood planks. It's one of the shorts. I can't. It doesn't matter. So, like, like where those movies are about him being on a, a plank that's gonna fall. Mm-hmm. The apparel here is him unknowingly almost getting hit by bulls constantly. Um, <laughs> you could also say that he's being chased by bulls, much like uh, one week where he's being chased by unmarried women. Yes. And is one week the one where he? Uh, he has to get married. He has to get married, and they have to build a house. No. Which is the one where they have to build the house? Seven chances. Seven chances, I think, is taking from uh, the the um, Roscoe Ar- and and Mabel one. Ma- Roscoe and Mabel adrift mm-hmm. has all this destruction of this house. Yes, I'm assuming but it's their house. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then then we have the destruction of house in a go in a gold rush. So like That's true big. Houses getting destroyed was very funny in, like, <laughs> to people in the cellar. In realistic ways. Right. Like, oh my God, this house fell off a cliff. Or this, absurd. This house fell in the water. This house was hit by a train. Yeah, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah, so what the reason Go West is so funny is because he takes it upon himself to protect this cow. Yes. Uh, and he's not particularly good at it, but the cow likes him. And he doesn't understand that the cow is going to go to the slaughterhouse eventually. Mm-hmm. And or, yeah. they, the cow can't come into the uh, the Ruining sleeping house. quarters with yeah. him. Have but, dinner, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, and, the, and the, the, so, so the uh, the um, well, it's the thing I'll get into later is is about the stunts. But so at this time, the the hardest story befriending a cow, uh, and and so the, the funny thing is, it's just a picture of him standing next to a cow is funny. Yes. You don't actually need to go any further than that because they both have these placid faces. Yes. Uh, And I think a cow ends up being the perfect animal um, because it's big enough to be awkward Mm -hmm. with him. Mm -hmm. And then it's uh, placid enough that we can project emotions onto it. If it was a dog, you know when a dog's happy. For sure. A cow... Can blink its eyes a couple Yeah, it basically just stares. And so you're like, oh, look how happy that cow is. That cow might be miserable. We don't know. Um, And... uh, I mean, it's ridiculous, and and in general, cows are cute, and they pick a particularly cute cow. On top of that, yeah, brown, brown eyes. Brown eyes, the cow. Um, but so so the idea that brown eyes is 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 the love interest mm-hmm. uh, of this movie, um, where so Kathleen Myers plays a pretty ranch hand who uh, recognizes. The, She's like a, a rancher's daughter, in my opinion. Right? Yeah, I'm sorry, rancher's daughter, the ranch hand, the the lead rancher's daughter, mm-hmm. and she recognizes immediately that he's uh has empathy and sympathy yes so that draws her to him Mm -hmm. and there's not necessarily a romance between them but like she wants there's a part where she asks the dad if he if can can we just give him the cow Mm -hmm. he really likes that cow Mm -hmm. um so again her she doesn't have that much character to her but it's it but it's the idea that instead of falling in love with this woman uh, he he protects this cow and does everything he can, and that the woman likes him because of his, the way he's protecting this cow is <laughs> really cute. I think another thing to add on to um, why a love interest of a cow is so unusual is because when he brings the stampede or all these uh, these these bulls to, through this town in order to get to the the rancher stockade, people are terrified right they are running into stores wreaking havoc just anything to get away from these cows because they don't belong in a barber shop it's, it's actually la belong. it's actually early la where they are so it's, it's cows just, just so, running through la it's, it's scary people are running away and um he doesn't really understand yeah how how dangerous bulls are because this this girl cow is so nice to him right so his lack of his the fact that he is a bad cowboy mm-hmm. makes him a good cowboy 
Yes. Which is a very Looney Tunes thing. It's he's a he's a cow conservationist. Yeah, it, it, I mean that that's something that that happens to Porky Pig, where he's so bad at something he's good at it. Yes. Or Goofy. <laughs> yes, that's a big one. Um. Mickey Mouse to a certain degree Donald Duck not so much because his whole thing is about the misery that's thrust upon him (laughs) he's still going to make the reference to the the goofy related thing right well I think that that this movie so if for me so me being who I am Mm -hmm. a critic no me being Gabe the the man who used to be a child uh, (laughs) to me Buster Keaton movies always feel more modern than a lot of Chaplin movies Because they were the things that happened in them were borrowed so liberally for uh, cartoons, Mm -hmm. and so whereas the Chaplin stuff feels like those early Disney and Max Fleischer cartoons, which feel old, Mm -hmm. a lot of the Buster Keaton stuff was picked up by Frizz Freeling and Tex Avery and Chuck Jones for Looney Tunes and Tom and Jerry. Yes, and so there, yeah, chases being a big thing in a lot of Keaton's movies. Um, Yeah, I mean you have the chase, the bride. Bride's chasing him in 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 uh, eight not eight weeks seven, seven, seven chances. chances the other one with a number uh, seven chances you have the the this movie ends on a really spectacular stampede chase mm-hmm. where he dons a he he just knows that they follow red mm-hmm. and uh, so he dons this devil costume and they start chasing him mm-hmm. and then it's sort of the other dawn on it dawns on him that. Uh, Oh wait, this is really dangerous. Yes, and he can really book it. And then uh, the cops like grab his tail. And yeah, he ends up saving the LAPD, which is I guess sort of uh, modern there. Uh, <laughs> but they're not really the Keystone cops. They're no. just not good at their jobs. They're not goofy at their jobs. Yeah, they're scared of the bulls. Yeah. Um, uh, so so that and then and then the general is basically the second half of the general is all one big chase. Yes. Uh, it's, instead of cars, it's trains. But uh, so a lot of that stuff ends up in in things. And then the Ardman Company, uh, a lot of their stuff. They did a uh, Wallace and Gromit and Chicken Run. Right. There's very Buster Keaton qualities to those. And uh, Pixar movies end up picking up from those other sources. Do you want to segue into Harold Lloyd? Well, I have a couple more things about this before. But yes, Harold <laughs> Lloyd ends up picking up this. And I think. Uh, I would say the the purest slapstick animation we currently have is the av- av- Amazing Adventures of Gumball or World of Gumball, mm-hmm. which is um, a show that's almost pure slapstick. It's oh, yes. it's become more satirical recently, mm-hmm. but it's like hardcore slapstick, and that's why its value. Um, and so these movies feel more modern because those things never went away. Absolutely. Whereas that some happens. of that Keystone Cop stuff kind of went away i think Mm -hmm. it feels it became obsolete the humor was just so of its time and i think even some of chaplin's became sort of obsolete Mm -hmm. and the other thing that i want to say about keaton here um is that he ended up being uh his stuff kept modern because people like jackie chan picked up on it that is true because keaton's really a comedic action hero bob newhart picked up on it too yeah but Keaton, as a comedic action hero, I don't think you can have comedic action movies without acknowledging Buster Keaton at this yes. point. Um, so you have, yeah, you have people like, I, I don't have any other examples, but basically any comedic action movie you can think of in every Jackie Chan movie that's popular, because Jackie Chan was originally a Bruce Lee ripoff and that didn't work out for him. So he started doing this hapless kung fu thing. And then he occasionally pairs up with other people, as Buster Keaton did, too. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they're put in such horrible peril for jokes. Mm -hmm. I I guess in Jackie Chan's case, sometimes it's to be spectacular. But a lot of times it's because it's funny. Yes. Uh, Those kinds of things, uh, they they just continue to feel modern because we're still doing them. Uh, and, And I think, yeah, and I think that this movie ends. I think that the Stampede Chase is really one of the coolest... Uh, chase scene action scenes in any of these movies i think it's a really solid and i should say battling butler ends with a pretty rousing boxing match yes that keaton's character finally snaps and that's another good illustration of what um how jackie chan can makes his fights look good because he evades people in in like how do you do that kind of ways the yeah. same way that um, Buster Keaton and um, Battle Butler did where how did I win that 
because it felt like I just fell down and avoided his punches. Is that really what I did? Well, and also he gets hurt in it. And yes. Jackie Chan really gets hurt. Often. And well, and he makes sure that's part of his movies is that you do think that maybe something bad will happen to him. Mm-hmm. Whereas uh, uh, a lot of other kung fu kind of wuxia movies, they're sort of invincible warriors. Especially thing for samurai movies, which is Japanese, not Chinese, but... There's a sort of invincibility of the characters, and Jackie Chan brought that vulnerability, which is something that uh, Keaton definitely has. <clears throat> um, I think that Keaton also has the perfect uh, silent scream, <laughs> which is something that Chaplin doesn't. Chaplin has angry face. Yes. Um, he has, like, dismay. Dismayed face. Uh, Keaton will yell. Yes. He has an ah! kind of face yes and you can y- your mind y- it, it can put the sound in with it mm-hmm. and he, he unleashes it at perfect times and go west when boxes are, or barrels are falling on him <laughs> he has and he just has this this face that makes me laugh every time this 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 fucking sucks face that he has <laughs> this i'm angry and this fucking sucks that is just because i guess because his eyes are bigger yes and his and his face has this sort of droopy quality I actually had a friend whose mom said I looked just like Buster Keaton when I was a teenager. Mm. And I can kind of see it because I had buggy eyes when I was younger and it kind of drooped to my face. So I've always really liked that about him. And you, you, you told me once or twice that you tried doing like um, pulling expressions in a mirror. Yeah, yeah. Being an only child, you spend a lot of time building up stupid skills like <laughs> uh, twiddling your thumbs and... And, yeah, dumb human tricks. And, yes, I would spend a lot of time in front of a mirror pulling faces. Mm-hmm. Um, That's comedic. <laughs> yeah. And I think that, but, but so the idea that he has the stone face, but has these very subtle variations in the stone face. Yes. Makes it very funny. Mm-hmm. It's not like Jim Carrey, you know, rubber pulling face. the most rubber face he can manage, which is something that you see in Laurel and Hardy. They pulled rubber faces. They certainly do. They also do the, 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 um, exaggerated crying that you were talking about. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and yeah, Abbott and Costello uh, is all about uh, Lou Abbott's, or about just Costello's, just as as outwardly crazy-faced as he can possibly be. Mm-hmm. And that was something Roscoe Arbuckle did, too, because he was, like, playing for the, the cheap seats with yes. his face. Absolutely. Um, I think that that's, that's something performative, Whereas Keaton sort of understands there's a camera on him. He doesn't need to be over the top about it. This is more. The funniest joke in any, my, uh, my, I almost call him Michael Keaton, <laughs> uh, Buster Keaton movie is in the movie The General, he gets in a situation where he's um, trying to help with a battle. And every time he points at someone to give them an order to do something, they get shot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, he, and his face just drops as he realizes... And his, every time he and he points as subtly as he can, and that person gets shot too. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. So, and there, oh, and I should say there are meta jokes that you, in in Go West in particular, the idea that he puts on he dons the entire I keep saying dons he puts on an entire cowboy outfit mm. but won't put on the cowboy hat <laughs> because he has the special Buster Keaton. Yeah. Hat. He he picks up the hat, looks up looks at it and he says this has is is me i don't I, I don't see any reason to get rid of it and then he is threatened during a card game and told he has to smile and he can't because he's buster keaton buster yes. keaton can't smile yes. and that's a meta text joke that's yes. not a joke in the movie itself mm-hmm. that's a joke for the audience to go ah ha, ha, buster keaton can't smile yeah it's it's definitely for the camera very third wall mm-hmm. so that that's a good thing um yeah i mean do you have anything else to say about this movie or can or should we move on to freshman We'll move on to Fresh, The Freshman, also 1925. I ordered them this way just because I wanted to. I don't know if they came out in this order. They probably didn't. Probably not. Um, this one's produced by and starring Harold Lloyd at a point when Lloyd was a box office draw. Yes. Um, and p- directed by Fred C. Newmeyer and Sam Taylor, who are sort of repertoire directors. They, they were in there to do it. They were work, work-a-day directors. Um. And I think of Harold Lloyd as the also ran of silent film comedians. Mm-hmm. He's the guy with the glasses. He's the guy with the glasses. And he's most famous for, this was his biggest grossing movie, but he's most famous for Safety Last because everybody did Safety Last. There's a million versions, there's music video versions of Safety Last. Mm-hmm. Just the one where he falls off uh, a clock tower. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
something hangs on to, I assume, the minute hand? Yeah, it's something like that. Like, that's been done in serious movies, like, as a seriously suspenseful thing and as a funny suspenseful mm-hmm. thing. Something about falling from a height is just humorous. <clears throat> and not, not falling is, yeah. And so, uh, he, but, but he doesn't get mentioned. He's the third guy. Like, yeah, and Arbuckle is... is All of the big three. Yeah, he's the third in the big three. Arbuckle is an important guy who's not given his due because of what happened with his court case. He's basically three and a half. Yeah, but but Lloyd is like... The, uh, there's there's Keaton. Keaton's the one everybody these days loves the most. Correct. Chaplin's the one for the critics. Mm-hmm. And Lloyd is the other guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's in part his fault because uh, I was looking into it and his early persona was just the little tramp. Yes. He just sort of did other people's bits. Yeah, and then he uh, eventually formulated an image with uh, Hal Roach, which, like um, I said before, you do your own production and you entrust the distribution to somebody else, another studio, which happened to be through Hal Roach. And they developed the fact that he should be this one guy with glass, or this guy with glasses, or a glass sort of um, uh, persona, where he's... um, He's motivated, he's a uh, uh, can-do attitude, and um, he's um, generally an all-American everyman in that way. Yeah, the, the, the stone face will do what he needs to do, mm-hmm. but he's not really into it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Chaplin will stumble into situations. So this is, some, this is the go-getter. Yes. He's like the perpetual loser who eventually gets... Through to the other Which side. Which you found hilarious because you're like, he's so attractive. Well, yeah, I do think it's very funny because, uh, excuse me, I burped. Uh, Charlie Chaplin is a tiny man. Yes. And Buster Keaton is a silly looking man. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, Harold Lloyd's Charlie handsome. Chaplin's mustache is not his own. Yeah. They made themselves look even more ridiculous. Yes. Uh, Harold Lloyd really has to fight to make himself look like a nerd mm-hmm. by putting on these glasses and stuff because he's clearly very physically fit. Mm-hmm. When, when he does a stunt, it's like, yeah, there's a physically fit man doing a stunt. When Buster Keaton does a stunt, it's like a magic trick because how did this, this little man pull off that amazing uh, physical feat? Mm-hmm. Like he's defying, gra- uh, 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 defying gravity. Whereas, yeah, Harold Lloyd, you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a muscular human <laughs> who, of course, can do a backflip. Yes. <laughs> and, and, uh, but, yeah, he casts himself as the underdog. Mm-hmm. And he has none of the curmudgeon-y thing that uh, Keaton and Chaplin have. No, he's just so idyllic. He sees the, the good in things. Right. And he's excited to go to college. Yeah. <laughs> it, which is funny because the freshman, uh, it was his first feature-length movie, I believe, or a long form. Uh-huh, yeah. I don't know what they called it. They didn't say feature-length. Mm-hmm. Long form, maybe. Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, and uh, it maybe was... Maybe it was with reels, like single reel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so this was his first try at a like, narrative film rather than mm-hmm. stunts. With a story. And this one does have a, a full story and characters and arcs. Mm-hmm. It might be the fullest story that we've wa- we watched for this podcast. I would agree with that. Um, I think that a lot of the, the gold rush is... Um, Situations. Situational comedy mm-hmm. and set pieces. Mm-hmm. And same thing with... Uh, uh, Go West has a lot of set pieces. Whereas this is really a story mm-hmm. with a couple set pieces thrown in. Yeah. You, you follow this, this, this man through, I assume, a school year. Yeah, it's, I don't know how much time passes, but he is a freshman uh, who comes onto campus and is immediately mocked because he's so into being at college. Mm-hmm. He has this little happy dance he does to shake people's hands. Yeah. And he, yeah, he gets in bad situations where he accidentally hurts the dean or actually takes the dean's car to into town. Does his speech. Yeah, and, and he's purposely thrown into... He's bullied without knowing he's being bullied, which yeah. is a one of those things, like, you see so many stereotypes. That I don't know if they all start here, but they definitely start around here. Yes, um, upperclassmen uh, picking on freshmen. And putting them in situations that, that are a... Uh, yeah, a hazing situation that's a really cruel... Um, prank Mm -hmm. it's not just a physical prank but it's like put them in a situation where they're going to make an idiot out of themselves and and not a water boy be on the team yeah um and so he 
his go go get it attitude is really that him not understanding that he's being teased. Yes, unwittingly. <clears throat> um, and yeah, again, that helps it make feel modern because all of these things are still used in in college and high school comedies. Uh, the he and uh, he's he's the hero and the heroine who he, he uh, their love interest they misunderstand each other's social cues yes uh, and he ends up getting in a higher social standing than her so she thinks she has no chance with him now mm-hmm. that's a thing that happens in every fucking high school movie that I watched with uh, Tyler for our podcast for sure um, there's the jocks are assholes there's a haplessly snobbish college dean mm-hmm. which is an Animal House thing they even well, wear those hats oh those silly beanies those beanies are worn in animal house as a way of look at these dorks they're wearing the stupid old hats Mm -hmm. um and uh he uh learned the hero learns to be true to himself which is an actual on-screen quote this time Mm -hmm. uh and uh it basically anything you can think of in a college or high school movie with with a romantic aspect is in here somewhere. I think the, the one thing that doesn't fit in modern films, but fits in with all of these, is some sort of wardrobe-related gaffe. Yeah. Where, where the, um, the, the tailor who's instructed to um, basically sew together his um, homecoming dance uh, formal suit, he has dizzy spells, so he can't fully finish his outfit. And while he's doing speeches, while he's uh, dancing, pieces of his suit is falling apart. He can't bend a certain way. The tailor's there and fainting as he sews on his, his sleeve. And something about um, losing your clothes, falling off a cliff, um, being bullied, it just ties all these films together. And, and it's funny in this, it's actually probably the funniest of the set pieces it's known for the end which has a football scene yes uh but it's probably the actual rose bowl yeah it's much funnier the the part where he's losing his clothes uh the idea that this is one thing he knows is is socially awkward yes (laughs) where he doesn't understand he's being socially awkward throughout the rest of the movie but he knows losing articles of clothing Mm -hmm. and parts of your clothing being a physical uh, a football dummy that, that linebackers and, and quarterbacks can tackle, that's perfectly normal. That goes over his head, yeah. Just like, he doesn't get that that's one. That's what being part of the team is. Or all the people laughing at his, not commencement speech, whatever you call the intro speech to your class. Oh, right, like the... Oh. He thinks they're laughing with him when they're laughing at him. Yeah, the first day of school speech. Yeah, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, and... and and so, yeah, that that is what it makes this different from the other movies, mm-hmm. is the way they approach that stuff. But uh, um, I would say that, like, for instance, we watched uh, Tyler and I watched uh, "Can't Buy Me Love." Mm-hmm. "Can't Buy Me Love" has a nerd that ends up uh, in the social, like, moving up the social echelon, mm-hmm. and then rejecting the girl who actually cared about him the before. Whole time. But in this case, he doesn't reject her on purpose. He just misunderstands, and he actually does get back together with her, and it's a very cute romance. Mm -hmm. Um, But it also has the whole thing of people being put in situations where they're being made fun of without knowing it. Mm -hmm. And he starts, uh, in, in, in that movie, he starts a dance that's a big hit at the, at the homecoming dance based on uh, his version of like how do people dance and instead of like watching a normal thing he watches uh, a sort of PBS special on African dance oh, so he does a big right. and so that's very similar to in this movie his uh, in, in Harold Lloyd's dumb little dance he does before a handshake catches on yes at the school yeah like it's the right thing to do all along right so I, I do think a lot of this ends up in what becomes teen comedies mm-hmm. absolutely <clears throat> and, a, and, and the, the adult college comedies like uh like Animal House, um, and yeah, the the uh, uh, I don't know how you prove this, but according to IMDb trivia, this is the first sports movie. Unlikely. I don't know how you prove that. Maybe it means first sports movie of a certain length, Possibly. but it does have a pretty spectacular ending football scene. I think they they mean like a, where a actual game was featured in it. It might be. Because they used real uh, USC players. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, uh, it, it's the thing that you see in every movie, every underdog. It's Rudy. 
they actually <laughs> tried to sue the people who made the Water Boy. That's right. Be- the 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 uh, uh, Harold Lloyd's granddaughter tried to sue the people who made the Water Boy, thinking it was basically the same movie. But she would have to have tried to sue so many people. There'd have to be precedent. Because every every underdog story, you you finally stick the guy in at the end, and he helps win the game. game. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but in this case, he he wins through just the most obnoxious, or obnoxious, I should say obnoxious, uh, preposterous oh, yeah. uh, movements that are... Like he doesn't even understand that when the ref blows the whistle, you're supposed to stop. stop so he gets tackled by the referee. That's a very good gag, I that think. That is true. Um, but so the thing it reminds me of the most is the goofy how-to cartoons. Yes. Uh, which are my favorite of the Disney shorts. Mm-hmm. Which also kind of uh, play with reality, like what is possible, mm-hmm. or how sports can like defy gravity, or... Uh, be a force of nature or something like that and so yeah and there is a football one of those that takes some gags from this Mm -hmm. and i think the football scene in mash is sort of thought thinking of this scene and i get a couple years later keaton made um college Mm -hmm. which is a pretty funny movie and I, i i feel like this at this point lloyd is not copying keaton anymore keaton's actually having to pay attention to lloyd Yes, because he doesn't go to school with a school spirit that Harold Lloyd right. has. Right. He has to teach himself that kind of spirit. Right. And so it's almost like a spoof of a spoof at that point. Like, I didn't realize that movie came out. I just assumed Lloyd was ripping off Keaton because he was known for being the also ran. But yeah, at this point, they're all having to sort of take formulas from each other. And I guess I read that um, also on IMDb trivia, which again, yeah, it's hard to say. <laughs> There was no source. It's like the Wikipedia. There was no source listed on this, but um, they apparently started to film and then deleted a big, bigger football scene for college, oh, realizing it had too much in common with uh, the freshmen. There is still football in the college. Yes. In college, but it's just not as enough as much. It's not. Not as enough. Not as enough. It's not as enough. Um, but there's yeah, there's a whole bunch of funny lawsuit things where. Uh, the producers were sued by author H.C. Whitwer, who claimed that this was just his book called The Emancipation of Rodney. And the case was in court so long that the poor guy died and his wife picked it up. Oh. And then she won. Oh. And then it was overturned in appeals. For goodness sakes. And then, so yeah, like, and then I, like I mentioned, in the year 2000, Lloyd's granddaughter tried to sue Disney for the water boy mm-hmm. and failed to. So it, it, the, the freshman ends up being such a, a vital piece of Americana that it's ripped off by everything, but it might have actually ripped off somebody else in the first place without crediting them. Correct. Yeah, I, th- I thought that was amusing that it's sort of like the movie embroiled and all this shit. <clears throat> but yeah, so uh, I, I, guess, uh, I guess the only other note I have here that I haven't covered is that uh, at one point someone, while he's being, his his sleeve has fallen off. Mm-hmm. And so his tailor is is standing behind a curtain act, acting as his arm. Mm-hmm. And as someone asks him for 10 bucks and uh, the tailor's arm reaches in the pocket and hands him 10 bucks. And with his own arm, he reaches and grabs the 10 bucks back. And I decided to look up how much is 10 bucks in nineteen twenty five dollars mm-hmm. or in $2,020. The exchange rate. The exchange rate would be $152.21. So, yes, I would not lend that guy five, uh, 10 that bucks. Out. It's implied that the uh, that the Harold Lloyd character, whose name is Speedy, who is a character he ended up pa- playing in other movies. Yes. It's implied that he has some money, his family has some money, mm-hmm. like, it, but they're not rich people, no, for sure. they can't give away $10. $10. <laughs> oh, and the other joke that I thought is 100% relevant is they refer to uh, the school as a large stadium with a college attached to it. That is true. It's a great joke. It is the program that keeps the college going. Yeah, which it's kind of sad that that's been the case for hundreds of a uh, hundred years now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's really all the notes I have on that one. Do you have any? Uh, oop, dropping my computer. Do you have any additional memories no, on this one? No. Um, my real final thoughts on on slapstick. Well, yeah, yeah. So I want to say, yeah, what is so we talked about these movies. These are like important filmmakers. So yeah, what are your final thoughts on slapstick in general? My my final thoughts is that our or like further watching or further reading is um, a movie called Limelight, which features both Charlie Chaplin and Keaton, the Tataki. 
and it's kind of like um, a semi-biographical film for uh, Charlie Chaplin if he wouldn't have gotten famous from film. If they would have stayed in the theater, that's how he would have turned out, was this, how this film is built. Uh, Abbott Cotts' Stella Meet the Keystone Cops, you already referenced. Mm. And then The Artist, the French film. Right, which is the sort of meta thing about sound. There's a lot of movies about how sound overtook and, and actually ruined... Singing in the Rain ruined, is a big one. Yeah, Singing in the Rain, the, how, how it actually ruined some careers. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think it ruined... Chaplin or Keaton's careers I don't I, I mean Lloyd still kept on doing stuff too he appeared in a lot of stuff yes I can't think of a single thing I've seen him in where he's talking though but he has a pretty long list of credits he went into TV and was very successful oh well there you go that's why I don't recognize the credits because I don't know old TV <laughs> um he had a, a series or um he hosted for something called the old gold comedy hour not only relate to Old Gold, the cigarette brand, but the Old Gold, the kind of like feeling of a set of film greats. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. He brought on uh, former stars, people that have been famous in the silent era, era and brought them back on TV. Basically, like, a, a, this is your life for silent hmm. film. So. Yeah. yeah, this is your life was a big deal thing that brought on the people like that. And then uh, what was the, um, the Groucho Marx show called? Uh... You Bet Your Life. Yeah, You Bet Your Life. And that then came. off and on, they would bring people on What's My Line and uh, mm. uh, what's the mystery guest. No, that's that's the mystery guest one. What's the other one? Well, that, and, well that's one thing that, that another thing we've been doing during this, uh, this lockdown is we've been watching British... Uh, game that's shows and uh, right. a lot of variety shows. Variety shows, mm -hmm. which is something that is kind of an art that was lost in America. Mm -hmm. We still had a lot of game shows and reality shows, but I think that something happened in the '80s where it was just decided that it was too lame for America. The the last time I really saw like a successful like variety show was Laughing, and then that's oh, very... who's it anyway? Yeah, making which um... is British. Exactly. <laughs> How does that work? Yeah, and so Sorry, the Brits British. just sort of figured out how to keep this particular keep thing going. going. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it just sort of, it was a dying art form here in America. They've tried to do some shit like that uh, because of COVID, because they have restrictions on audiences. That's true. And I think it's been awkward every single time I've seen it on TV. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think that, that you're, yeah, the, that's what it built into. That's what the silent slapstick built into. I think it was cartoons variety shows um chaplin and keaton were also successful because of because of united artists correct um keaton keaton was his his own thing he was um, his own company okay correct uh he he kept his own production he uh decided it'd be a good idea to uh join up with mgm and have them distribute his films and that's where his career kind of kind of fell off mm. he turned to alcoholism because the that transition was was not a good one so it was hard for him yes um whereas chaplin who also had problems with substance uh <laughs> he 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 had good he made money as a producer so he he was still pretty and then arbuckle's life fell apart as we've mentioned several times now mm -hmm. yeah but yeah so i guess Harold lloyd so tv so so we have remnants of this era in independent film because yes, they started their own studios yes uh, outside the system tv variety cartoons yeah and then and then you get something like um sunset boulevard where yes it harkens back to where it harkens back where and, it's like uh whatever happened to baby jane has some aspects of that yeah and then also uh, movies on TV is another part of that film mm -hmm. where she sees old movies on television mm -hmm. of herself. So, so it, it becomes it becomes a modern through cartoons and sort of uh, retrospective. Yeah, like and a, nostalgic. A really, like what what is so and so up to these days? Yeah, where are they now? And then and then I think the other thing that directly comes from it is early sound stuff like the Three Stooges is, is uh, to a lot of people, their first live action slapstick. I'm not a very big Pies fan of Three Stooges. in the Stooges. face, yeah. slapstick, uh, yeah, gags. Uh, um. Laurel and Hardy stuff. They had silent stuff, but they were more sound era. Correct. And they, um, they started with um, 
music halls for sure. Right. Laurel right. did. Makes a big difference. Yes. Um, I, I don't know if any of the guys we were talking about earlier can sing. <laughs> It was not their job to learn how to sing. It was their job to learn how to do physical stunts. Correct. Um, Studio systems would, like, cultivate people. Mm -hmm. Teach them how to sing. Teach them how to dance. Silent films, there was there was really no rules like that. Yeah. There was no grooming. And then and then you get the year of Costellos. Even after that, um, their Monster Mash movies are their best movies. Mm -hmm. That was another thing I watched a lot as a kid. Yeah. So it never went away. So we have this 100-year-old art form that just takes a different form yeah that just keeps going and it, it really comes out of film it's really important part of movie history mm -hmm. yeah that's my final thought on the subject <laughs> i'll leave it there then you'll leave it there then you don't have any more thoughts no just further watching that was that was my last bit okay well then uh i should say the thing we've been watching religiously now is is the british show taskmaster, taskmaster my god we're almost out of them there's a lot of them for free on youtube yeah it's it's like um comedians british comedians being forced to do silly things Tasks. that's it that's all there is to it and somehow mm -hmm. it feels really fresh it doesn't feel it doesn't feel like battle of the network stars or any they of that really garbage don't. as usual you can reach me at uh the genre grinder website on the genre grinder facebook page at genre grinder.com is the website on uh at Genre Grinder on Twitter, um, or at Gabe M, as in Matthew Powers, on Twitter. I guess you can get glimpses of me through your work since I do your proofreading. Yeah, she's my proofreader. And I actually have some review stuff I got to do. I think that even though COVID's very far from being over and you should <laughs> still wear your masks, um, a lot of companies have figured out ways to deal with it. So I've actually been sent a couple review copies yeah, recently. It's been a welcome surprise. I've I've really enjoyed getting um, seeing stuff in the mail again. Mm -hmm. So that's nice. So I w I will actually have some new Blu-ray reviews, and maybe even 4K reviews. I had just had one. I just already posted that. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, look forward to uh, uh, Patrick and I are gonna do kind of like what we did when we watched as many 1981 slash movies as we could. We're gonna watch as many shot on home video like shot on tape. I had to make this specific because there's a lot of movies that were edited on tape and a lot of movies that were shot on like this really like advanced TV tape, which I'm not counting. Ugh. Like people who got like camcorders and shot horror movies. I've seen my share of those and I don't ever eat. Any no, they're, of they're awful. There's, <laughs> but, but there's something to them and Patrick is really into them and he knows a lot about them. So this was going to be a two or three parter and Patrick and I are going to just talk and talk and talk. So I don't know how many movies we're going to cover just yet. But that will be something fun for the end of the year to bring us into 2021, which, uh, again, got to remind you, we'll still be in a pandemic. Please wear your masks and socially distance. Be safe, you guys. Uh, as, as of recording this, they announced that they might have a working vaccine. It's not going to be working for a while, guys. <laughs> be responsible. Uh, and, uh, and I love you. And goodbye. I love you too, Christine. <laughs> Is she prettier than me? <laughs> no, all, all my viewers, but I love you, of course, Christine. No, thank you. Okay. Too. And goodbye. Hello. Hello.